if we don't have a heart to heart connection at the end of any of it, I felt like I missed it. And I want to turn the car around, go back and say, boys, how are you experiencing me? Yeah. Jenny, how are you experiencing me? And take it and go course correct mm -hmm. and reestablish heart to heart connections. Because if, if I grow old and, and my boys just move and they don't want to come back and talk to me, like I've missed it. Yeah. Relationship and connection, I, that's what we're designed for, union. Mm -hmm. We're designed for a union with God. We're designed with union with each other. Yeah. And if those are severed, um, that's not success. Yeah. Thank you for making this trip and oh, recording with me. Jeff, thank you. It's been uh, it's a it's a pleasure to be asked to be on here and to share today. So thanks for having me. So a guy from Boise, Idaho. Are you outside of the city or where where are you at about? Yeah, we're in Meridian, Idaho. So Meridian. A little suburb about ten miles away. Okay. Yeah. So you're from Idaho, but here we find ourselves in Jacksonville, Florida. <laughs> so you're out here doing some work uh, a little bit north, and uh, but you made the trip down. I wanted to start with this question, and I've got several just like prompts, and we'll see where God leads us with okay. this conversation, but. Let me see if I can get this name pronounced right. A troubadour, being a troubadour, or looking at people as troubadours. Like, what does that mean? What does that stir up in you, that word? You bet. Well, this all started, troubadour um, all started because we needed a name. We're doing retreats, and yeah. we help with a ministry called Wild Courage. And we had guys coming in, and guys really like to pound their chest and tell people about who they are. That's right. I'm so-and-so, and I run a bank, or I make so much money, and the, and they can hide behind that. Mm -hmm. And really, we really wanted a more intimate, um, authentic uh, way for guys to talk. So we wanted to eliminate them speaking about what they do. Yeah. Because, you know, we believe God is all about who we are, mm -hmm. who we're becoming. And we said, and we, when we started this retreat, we said, what are we going to do? We need to, you know, we know while the heart uses a chimney sweep. Yeah, sure. And we're like, that's just not the flavor we're looking for. But so... If you look up Troubadour, um, it was from the Nightly Times in the Middle yeah. Ages, and the Troubadour was a, a, a the king's poet, storyteller. Yes. And uh, some of them could entertain in this, but they were storytellers. Mm -hmm. You hear, you know, um, some country singers talk about being a Troubadour, and yeah. and some of these rappers are Troubadours. And but we believe in our Wild Courage Ministry that Troubadour, everybody has a story to tell, mm -hmm. and every story actually matters. You know, I can go to YouTube and get your five best podcasts sure, sure. right now. But I really don't know you or know your story. And I know that your story was the one thing that, that God's designed, yeah. called for, influences. And so a troubadour simply a, 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 the king's storyteller. Wow. And, and it, we use that to make sure we are focusing on the main thing. When yeah. we minister to guys or when who we are, it all comes back to who, are be, who we are and who we're becoming. Mm. Always in process, always in journey with God. We're all troubadours who've got a story to tell yes. that matters. Yes. Uh, and I think about your boys right now and them understanding what a troubadour is and how they are troubadours. They, their stories matter. Would you tell a little bit about um, the current chapter of your boys? So you can, I mean, you're welcome to just kind of like, uh, like, like not, I don't like the phrase brag on them, but like talk, talk about your boys. Why, like what, what kind of stirs up in your heart when you think about them? Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, so I have two boys, Calvin and Drew. Uh, one's Calvin's 19, of course, first born, uh, curly haired monster. Okay. And, uh, he's very muscled right now. He thinks he can take me and if he's listening. It's going to be a good match. <laughs> yes. Bring it. <laughs> I can hold my own a little bit for a little longer than he thinks. Um, Drew is my, and anyways, Calvin is a, uh, Calvin's a leader. He's yeah. uh, going to school, started his own video highlight sports business right oh, now, cool. and um, is just all in. Mm -hmm. And uh, Drew is our 16-year-old Labrador, yes, <laughs> per se. Yes. Um, mm. Full of life, full of sunshine, yeah. brings, brings, uh, brings, he is the life of the party, and we love him so much. And he, uh, he's just gifted and talented with seeing the other person across the room. And, and listening to their story, he, he takes great pride in communicating with people in the room at 16, like, you know, accomplished Toastmasters do, very gifted yeah. in that area. So. Amazing. How would your boys, if I asked them that question about you, how would they, what are some of the words they'd use to describe dad? Oh, man. Well, I think today yeah. they would use uh, uh, strong, uh -huh. shows up, whether I'm in trouble or whether I've just won the, the game. He's going to show up the same way. And they're going to say, they're going to say that I'm going to say that I love watching them play. Yeah. 
regardless of whether they won, lost, were in the game, were on the bench, whether they did great or did not, mm-hmm. they're going to say, my dad loved watching me play. Yeah. Mm. And, uh, yeah, that, mm. that takes the cake. <laughs> it, that kind of takes me to a, a next question around true wealth. What, is, what does it look like to succeed? What does it look like to um, have, like, a full, meaningful, wealthy life? And I've heard you explain this once, but I think it'd be fun to just hear your heart on this. Like, like what... What truly matters to Brian Bird? What truly matters to you and your wife? What are, what are some of the ways you would answer that question? I think today I'd answer that question very differently than I used to. I used uh, Today, I would say the things that matter most to us are the ones who matter most, mm-hmm. meaning if you lit a match to all the things that can burn, not people, but stuff, stuff yeah. and all the stuff goes away, what are you left with? That's the things that matter the most and what we need to protect, strive to grow in, to foster, to steward, to father, yeah. to protect. Yeah. Those are the things that matter the most. And today, um, I think a heartfelt connection with our boys, with each other, my wife and us, um, mm-hmm. that heartfelt connection is number one, regardless if they're successful or not, regardless if they have some big job or get into big school or get a scholarship or anything they can do. Those are great. They're fun, <laughs> and they're fun to watch, grow, learn. But if we don't have a heart-to-heart connection at the end of any of it, I felt like I missed it. And I want to turn the car around, go back, and say, boys, how are you experiencing me? Yeah. Jenny, how are you experiencing me? And take it and go course correct mm-hmm. and reestablish heart-to-heart connections. Because if, if I grow old and and my boys just move and they don't want to come back and talk to me, like, I've missed it. Yeah. Relationship and connection, I, that's what we're designed for, union. Mm-hmm. We're designed for a union with God. We're designed with union with each other. Yeah. And if those are severed, um, that's not success. Yeah, yeah so success, success to me is union, connection. Mm-hmm. Um, and sometimes that gets real messy. It does. <laughs> it does. <laughs> because sometimes i got to lay down that, Oh, you didn't do very well at that. And I'm a father. And, um, well, if I'm a father of Wild Courage Ministry, or I started this, or I'm, I'm, a, I'm into law enforcement, or I'm, I'm a person of faith, and you're supposed to act a certain way. And when they don't, yeah. or if, if something else happens, I, I, I got to choose to be okay with it. Then I'm still going to choose heart-to-heart connection, and regardless yeah. of my reputation... Regardless of my accomplishment or, or the image that people think I should have, I'm still getting their back, getting in the ditch if I need to get in the ditch, yep. getting on a platform if I need to get on a platform. Wherever it takes, I'm going to show up and be present and, and, and be the father where I need to be. And, and sometimes I'm going to make mistakes along the way, and I'm going to ask forgiveness and break some glass. Yep. <laughs> but that's most of That's success. Um, course correcting along the way right now. <laughs> and that is, I feel like a gentle invitation, like the idea of course correcting and you saying it right now, uh, like I think about it's a daily, like where areas have I spotted that, nope, that's actually a little bit off course, but I can correct. Oh, another area stumbled there off a little bit can correct. How would you encourage me to start with, but then also the other dads around living a life that's looking for and paying attention and curious about areas that need course corrections? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Well, one is our union with God. If we're walking with God, we have a barometer. A, the cross was enough. We are the ransom. We are the ransom. Our life is worth the death of Jesus on the cross. A, our, our baseline. And with that in mind, yeah. looking for areas that might be off. Well, are you working 80 hours for the fifth week in a row? Be good. Maybe that's a yeah. sign. Spotting something there. Yep. Yeah. Now, sometimes we need to, we're called to work 80 hours. Sometimes we're called to come through. But I'd probably argue not all the time. Right. Um, and and if, if our relationships are damaged along the way when we're done with it, I'm course and correct. And yeah. I'm going back like, oh, where did I have to turn around, show up that game? Even, I'll give you a story about yeah, this one. Great. So um, at Wall Curries, we have lots of events, lots of fires, and we have uh, lots of guys in need. The need's never going away. And 
And we had an uh, event in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, big event with some of our partners out there. Grant Gallier, if you're listening, <laughs> horse trainer, cool. trains horses by love. And at the same weekend, my son's senior year last year, last spring, uh, he had a, a, a rugby game in Rigby, Idaho. Same day, I'm supposed to be leading a group, so supposed to be the wild courage guy and help yeah. guys process their story and find healing and uh, provide a container for grief. And I said to our leaders, Jeremy and Mike, said, hey, my son's got his last away game in, in rugby. It's a senior. Senior. Yeah. And I need to go. Yeah. And they said, okay, we'll make do. We'll figure it out. So in the middle of the retreat, I got my car and drove three hours to Rigby from Jackson. Maybe two hours yeah. through the Tetons. It was kind of a nice drive. Oh, my. But showed up, and I found out my son had a concussion, and he, he didn't even play much. But you were there. I was there. Yeah. Now, this is... This is why I knew I did the right thing. I knew he wasn't playing, and but by the end of the game, I said, okay, well, I'm here. He saw me, and I was with my wife. I said, okay, I think we talked. I said, okay, I think I'm going to head back to the retreat, all right. And I'm, I walk around the field, and I'm about ready to get in my car, and I look over, and uh, Cal's on the sideline, and he's, um, he looks over, and he sees me, and, he, and the game's going on. The rugby, it's on the pitch, and the ball's getting kicked, and I see, like, through the ball where it goes over, and um, he stands there and gives me the old Taylor Swift heart sign and puts the heart above his, above his head. And like, during the middle of a rugby game, you're supposed to be tough, right? No, not too many boys are going to sit there and put right. the heart sign above their, their head dad. and look at their dad. Yeah. I just melted. Got back to my forerunner. I'm like, yeah, that's my son. And I turned up the bass real loud so everybody could see me and honked the horn a few times during the game. <laughs> and I was like, that's heart-to-heart connection. That's when I was doing the right thing. Mm-hmm. That's a place of success. Yeah. Uh, and, and I drove back, and we did the retreat, and all. It was fine. People <laughs> knew I was gone, but they didn't know I was gone. Right. And the right things were the right thing. I remember Mike looking at me, our partner, looking over and saying, boy, if you wouldn't have gone, I would have thought something was wrong with you. You didn't have your priorities correct. And like, that's my guys I like to hang out with. <laughs> that's the circle. We're, looking, we're all looking for that circle who help us align with the things that really matter most. Exactly. Exactly. Um, the, you know, a promise that all of us dads feel like have made to ourselves is we want to be great dads. We want to be dads who show up. We want to be dads who take the drive and leave the work behind or the opportunity for other people and say, no, for my kids, my, my son, in your case, like I'm going this concept though, of keeping promises we make to ourselves. Like there's a lot of dads, myself included, who feel like, well, this is my intention is this, and I've spoken this out loud, or I've spoken this internally. Um, but that in small ways don't keep those promises. And we head in either one way, a direction of, well, it's just kind of part of the deal as I commit to things and I don't do them. Or there's the other option, which is I'm the kind of guy who follows through on promises I make to myself. Uh, coach me on the path you would choose and you'd choose for all of us of those two options. That's a great question, Jeff. Um, I'm going to default to keep your, do what you say. Yeah. Do what you say. Barometer. Do what you say. If you do what you say, you don't have to please anybody. You don't have to be codependent on someone liking you. If you do what you say, and I'm guilty of not, we all are if we're honest, it's the barometer we check. But if you do what you say, you don't, you don't have to worry about anything other than me showing up for the day. I said I was going to do this. I'm going to do it. Okay, great. When we don't, we lie to ourselves. <laughs> Subconsciously, we're liars now. Yeah. We're getting away from our identity again of the ransomed ones whose lives are worth the death of the cross yeah. because now we're liars. That's a, actually a sin to look that up. And, and we're subconsciously lying to ourselves and, and we're, we're, we're posers. We're posing. Wow. Whether we try it or not. Wow. And so I'm going to default to do what we say. Yeah. Um, do we do this every time? Try to. Mo- way more often than not. Mm-hmm. Is there exceptions to the rule? Sure. But gosh, if we can make a small adjustment right now and we can do what we say, what's going to be different? I'd ask our listeners, what, what could be different in your life if one day you just did what you said all day long? Now, the other side of it, and what's going to happen? What would that effect have on you? And here's the other side of this. When you do what you say, um, it, 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 changes, uh, it changes what you're saying to people. And here's, here's the litmus, litmus test. Try practice it. If you're going to do what you say, text it to somebody. 
just put it in words yep. and see what happens. You're going to do a lot less texting. <laughs> So you know, put the, it, not only you're putting in words though, you are sending those words to someone who cares and probably like subconsciously you've locked yourself in because you like, you, cause we actually do care about our perception with other people. Oh yeah. <laughs> so often we don't care about our perception to ourself in like, I committed this thing to myself and I can let slide. But when you commit to somebody else and you actually subtly nudge them to be someone who steps up and steps in with their whole heart. A hundred percent. And you know, the, the thing about, you know, Jesus talking about loving others with your whole heart, love your neighbors. Mm-hmm. Well, we got to love ourselves first by by doing what we say, we're actually loving ourselves because we value ourselves enough to keep our word. Yeah. We do that, we overflow into other people's lives like no other. We are a river of life yeah. if we keep our word to ourselves first. Yeah. And I've worked really hard on this the last few years, haven't always been this way, not perfect by any means. Um, I, I, used to, I'm gonna, I, I tell people sometimes I'm a, I'm a recovering pleaser because I, say, I used to say yes to everything. Will you do the small group? Yes. Will you run this program? Yes. Will you show up early? Yes. Will you show up late? Yes. Well, then what happens is the ones that matter the most, our wife and kids, get the short end of the stick. And you start, yeah. yeah. Even as men's ministry, you start having this great, these great bonds mm-hmm. that happen in close quarters and going through books like Walla Heart and you're discovering heart issues and you're, you're advising Jesus in to heal things. At the same time, if you're saying yes to everybody, the ones at home, um, what happened to those bonds? Right. And so, yeah. 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 That's, uh, I had a tension over the last two weeks, actually. And this, is, this ties with what we talked about before we hit record here about this Friday morning pursuit group. So our mutual friend, Zach Ernst, and the guys doing sandbag workouts on the beach in the dark. So I've done... I think nine straight Fridays in Flagler Beach, Florida, with a group of guys in the dark. We're we're going after we're ending with jumping in the ocean. Yeah. Well, spring break rolls around. Well, we had one, we had daylight savings hit, and then two spring breaks. So a bunch of my core guys had some travel with their friends. It's funny, we're new to Florida, so we don't go anywhere on spring break. It's like we're staying, we love this place. Right. Uh, these guys who live here for a long time are like, we're taking trips, we're taking our family places when our kids are off school. But we so I had two Fridays in a row, I um canceled the Friday morning workout because all my core guys were unavailable and there was some bad weather and I was tired, right? (laughs) I have thought the last two Fridays and we were hosting some people. So that was my other, like I I went through excuses and I canceled two Fridays in a row. Now it's amazing. One, I feel like I just, it it wasn't like a once a week workout because I'm working out other times throughout the week, but there's something that's kind of eaten me a little bit around like I had a streak going and it was just something I'm there. Flagler Beach, Florida. I'm on the beach, yeah. 5.55 in the morning, in the dark, with the sandbag, right, for those eight or nine weeks, and I lost it. I, so I feel like there's a tension I'm wrestling with on this that I feel like I wanted you to talk to because there's dad's listening and there's myself that's like, I want to be someone who keeps his word and who experiences strength of a repeated commitment yes. around the same place. How would you how, Yeah, how would you coach me? Yeah, I would. I would say... It's, it, it's easy to start with physical activity. Yeah. Your workout in the morning, your workout at night, your workout at lunch, and you commit to yourself to work out. I work out every day. Yeah. Every day. If it's, if it's a walk, jog, yeah. stretch, yeah. it counts. Do a workout. Do a workout. It doesn't have to be, um, you know, 15 power cleans and, and 200 deadlifts and 50 burpees, although one day I might do that, but, but every day. And you start to put that streak together like you're no. saying. You don't miss, and you and you can tell people I work out every day, and you know you do. Yeah. You 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 have nothing to you're nothing to juggle. You're and you're all of a sudden your subconscious, your your confidence comes up, yeah. and you know next time when someone says, "Hey, I need you to do this," and you say, "Hey, I can do that for you," your confidence is so fortified. You're coming through twice with the confidence. You know you're going to show up. Well, before, if you weren't working out, if you didn't have any victories going into it. He's like, man, I just said yes. And like, hey, honey, I said yes, but what do you think about this? I don't know if I'm going to... All of a sudden, this doubt. Yeah. Doubt becomes a powerful thing in your, in your narrative and, and in, the, in your vibration, in your signal, and in, in who you are. Are you confident in who you are or are you doubting? And I think when you partner with... When you come through for yourself again and you partner with showing up again and again and again and again and again, yeah. even if it's to go for a walk in something physical... Mm-hmm. Coming through and work just becomes second nature. It's who you are. Yep. It's who Jesus is to die on the cross. He never like got nervous and got off the cross. 
It's a day before Easter. That's why I yeah, have this reference. Totally. But it's like, what, he did what he said. Yeah. So we have a, we kind of have a gauge. If we're, if we're spiritual, we have a gauge. Like he did what he said. I'm not, this isn't what Brian thinks. Mm-hmm. This is coaching from, from the gospel. Yep. And um, so I would say, I'd say show up. Show up. <laughs> it's also exhausting the resurfacing a decision. If it's already made and you do it, it's, it's kind of exhausting to kind of resurface, to kind of weigh out the pros and cons and make a decision versus if it's early enough in the morning that's not really taking away anything from my family anyways, it's like I, I don't need to resurface that. I wonder if I should or shouldn't. Oh, 100%. Here's a, here's a good example. You just, you just reminded me of yeah. um, I also was doing uh, with our friends Daniel and Zach out at Pursuit yes, 90. Right. I love those guys. Yeah, I was zooming in from Boise for a period of time to um, to get some good habits with those guys. They, they kind of have this down. And what I mean, they, they show up Monday, Wednesday, Friday, rain, sun, uh, sunshine, does not matter. Dark light, whatever. Well, you guys know if you follow the weather, a few months ago there was a monsoon in L.A., still a beach. You know, 10-foot swells, the rain's going sideways. <laughs> We zoom in, these guys got rain jackets on, and the rain's going sideways. They still at the, the pier. camera rolling. Still rolling, still doing, still showing up. And I thought, well, I look outside my garage, it's six, six inches of snow, it's three degrees. I'm like, well, let's put on some parkers, let's go. Yeah. And uh, we just did it. And I think doing hard things, yeah. becoming better, showing up in adversity and, mm-hmm. and, and things like working out in weather. Yep. Like you can show up in the weather most of the time, unless it's lightning. Yep. Florida lightning, no good, no good. Yeah, you can do burpees inside though. Come yeah, on, come yeah. on. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. But a little water, a yeah. little heat, a little, mm-hmm. something showing up like that. It just does something for your soul. Like, it does. I just bet on myself. I showed up and so did my friends in a camera in Seal Beach in a snowstorm in Idaho. We're made for this. There's something in you. Yeah. It pulls on that innate um, spiritual thing that, that, that God bore in us when he said, he looked at us and he said, I'm going to reside in you. Yeah. You're what? You're yeah. going to reside in here? Yeah. Why? Because <laughs> yeah. you're made for it. You're made. You have what it takes. You're a son. You're ransom. Like he just, like he bets on us. Why wouldn't we bet on ourselves and show up and partner with him? Wow. You've said that <laughs> phrase two or three times, uh, bet on yourself. And it's just not a phrase that I use, this idea of like, why would I not bet on myself? And part of it ties back to you saying you got to love yourself, actually. It's not, it's easy to kind of put all the focus outward. If you don't actually love yourself, how can you bring love? But would you unpack just a little further, Brian, this idea of betting on yourself and why you use that phrase and expression? Yeah, I think it goes right down. Um, when I say bet on yourself, I mean, Love yourself and believe in yourself like he does. Mm. Align, now, I'm not talking false humility. Mm. If, if any of the listeners that grew up in the church, you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, we're just poor sinners. Yeah. At the flip side, we have sinned and we've been forgiven. Yeah. And he bets on us and he resides in us. So there's a two-edged coin there that we're the ransom one. So let's get with it. When you bet on yourself, you bet that, yeah, you're valuable enough. Mm that you're going to come through with your word. You're going to do what you say and say, bet on yourself. Like, believe that you can do what you want to do, what you're set out for, what you're called from the Lord, even though all these people out in the world are going to say, there's not enough time. You're too tall. You're too short. You're too fat. You're too skinny. They're going to come up with all kinds of excuses because they want to justify themselves. Well, that's not what I'm talking about. Betting yourself is like, let's align with God. Yeah. Align with God. Let's pause for a Mm. minute. Let that settle on our hearts, what God really says about you. Yep. <laughs> I, I want to move us into talking about your boys and talking about the season of fatherhood today. And then we'll kind of unpack and go backwards a little bit. But I know the theme of excuses, the theme of do hard things, <laughs> the theme of like identity and like, like who are they and what are they stepping into? I know those are some themes that I know are powerful and important for you. What would you say, though, in this chapter of fatherhood, like... What has your attention, what has more of your heart focus when it comes to fathering your boys right now in this chapter? Yeah, I think, you know, at 16 and 19, it's very different than 6 and 10. That's right. And what, what, what grabs my attention that I'm, I'm thinking about more often than not is, is my heart-to-heart connection with my boys, with my wife, our family. Like, is that, is that the most important thing? And... I'm trying to think of a good example, but, you know, or is it, when I, when my youngest talks to me, am I, do I find myself like a drippy faucet asking him, is your homework done? Mm. Did you go to your football training? Did you lift weights? Do I need to get up at 530 with you? Did you set your alarm? Did you, did you, mm. did you? Yeah. 
Or am I tuned into, to have an awareness of as a good father of, hey, how was that? I really enjoyed hanging out with you. Mm-hmm. Man, that's so, how much fun did you have? Like, there's no judgment. There's no reminders. There's no helicopter. No nagging, right. Nagging. I'm not, I'm really asking myself, am I slipping into a little bit of codependence as a dad to make sure that these guys are going to show up in a way that I can show off to or mm-hmm. brag about? Oh, my son has a four or five at the country club when I play the foursome. Sometimes I slip into that, to be honest. Yeah. And I'm like, no. Can they enjoy me? Yeah. Here's a question I, that really hurts to ask. I, I, I try to ask them, uh, you know, how are you experiencing me? And sometimes that's a really fun answer. <laughs> and sometimes it's like, Dad, all you tell, when I talk to you, all you do is tell me things to do or check on me. Have I done this? Have I checked the list? I'm like, oh, have I? You're kind of like a taskmaster. I mean, a taskmaster doesn't hold relationship very well. Yeah. It doesn't promote value and it doesn't love very well. It accomplishes things. Yeah. Oh yeah. But if I'm task task master, a master, I'm not the father. I'm I'm almost giving up authority as a father where I where 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 I've been given charge to lead my boys to become young men yeah. or to get them in a community with four or five others in the same way to become young men, if they're just checking boxes, I've lost the vision. And I've done this before, and I'm guilty, and I've repented of it, and I've broken soul ties with it, and I've said, Jesus, come in and heal the, ta- the, the task. Yeah. Because it's not my value. Wow. <laughs> so God came and walked in the garden with Adam and Eve. His desire was to walk with. I doubt he had a clipboard and asked them, well, how's your quota of naming going, right? I mean, how's yeah. this going? How's that going? Now, there was some boundaries that he placed, but he was still ready to come and walk with them again, even after they crossed the boundary, right? It's just yes. coming for a walk. Yeah. Coming for a walk. Uh, so I, I mean, I'm actually thinking three hours ago, running that 5K with my 10-year-old. So my three oldest girls all got to do those trail runs I told you about, but I'm running it with her and she's had a little bit of a cold and and actually had to walk probably about as much as she ran of the 5K. And she told me that if I hadn't run with her, she would have walked the whole thing. So in some sense, I think if I asked her, how did you experience dad for those 42 minutes? It was a yeah. long 5K. Um, <laughs> I'm so I'm proud of her. She did the 5K. She's, she didn't quit. I actually told her the story when I was in cross country in high school, I did quit a race. Wow. I hit a wall and I quit and walked back without my shoes on. I said, I'm, I wish I would have finished that race. So, so proud of her. But I wonder... I do wonder, did she experience me as someone that just was glad to walk with her in the jungle? Because it was a beautiful spot, like a jungle type type course. Yeah. Or did she experience the right amount of push of like, no, let's do it. The next time the shade ends, let's let's run to the next spot that's shady. Let's just let's run a little bit. So I'm curious now, and I'm gonna go back and ask her. Heck yeah. I'm not actually certain how she experienced me. So that coaching, I mean, it's that's powerful. I want my girls to do hard things, experience resilience, experience commit, f- finishing their commitment. But I also want to be ge- a gentle dad. Where do you think the, I know I know of some of the stories of the mountains that you've summited with your boys, even when they were young, you were taking them up these 9,000, 11,000. <laughs> uh, where do you think the, to gauge out and to help me know the, the just glad to be with you, take a walk or do hard things? Where do you, how do you play that out? Yeah. Well, I default to walking with God in it. Mm-hmm. Our, my sons have different personalities, different needs, and my wife, different, different needs altogether, right? And everyone's different. So I can push a pedal down with one son, yeah. and they're going to respond well, or the other one's not. Yeah, you got to know. And so, yeah, I'm just trying to think of a... So when there was... I think Drew was seven and Cal was 11, yeah. we went up this mountain called uh, He Devil. Yeah, it's great a, name. Yeah, right. It was a He Devil. It's a 9,000 foot mountain. We started at like six and you're in the, you're in the um, Hell's Canyon area between Idaho and Oregon. Pu- beautiful area, but wow. lots of shale, lots of huge boulders, lots of peril. I mean, you, you get a foot caught in a boulder, it could move and pin you. And wow, wow. You're making another movie. But, <laughs> wow. But um, so there's enough danger, but we, I hiked them in there and we went up to something called a goat path. Because literally, when you go up this path, you'll see goats. Cool. <laughs> and it's steep, and it's hard. But my boys got halfway up at 7-Eleven. They're like, it was tears. Yeah. And they started to cry. Hurt. Hurt. I said, oh, did I put... And we're at 7,000 feet. Mm-hmm. We're huffing and puffing. Mm-hmm. And we're like, it's not like the Florida beach by any means. Yeah, yeah. And I, I'm like, did, 
am I pushing them too hard? Right, that question. So awareness, asking, mm-hmm. and I said, all right, I said, all right, let's take the weight off. We had a little backpack, so sure. stuff with chips, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, good substance, yeah. Yeah, Dad had the heavy pack. We took it all off. I was like, all right, let's sit down for a minute. Let the tears calm down. I said, mm-hmm. hey, we could go back to the truck right now if you want. We got to drive home. Well, we can go a little bit further. And what do you guys, and, and I was gentle. Yeah. I wasn't, I didn't have the whip. Although I can pull out the whip. That's probably my second nature. But I went in with that gentleness. moment, you were not taskmaster at that moment. Not. Right. And we did. Mm-hmm. We, we, got, we gathered. We got back up. We made it up and into the basin. And we ended up climbing this huge mountain. When we came back, little Drew, number se- at age seven, decided, as, as Calvin and I picked up the camp, we were sleeping in these single, yeah. single man tents Amazing. and the, 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 you know, the stoves and the food. We're picking all the camp up. We just climbed this mountain. He's 11. He's getting tired. Drew's seven, so I let him just chill. And he's eating. He's eating. I'm like, oh, you got to eat. Well, anyways, we didn't notice. He ate all the food. So <laughs> I ate like three MREs. And, and Calvin and I looked at him. I'm like, oh, we got to climb. And we had to climb 2,000 foot back out to the truck before it's over with. No food. So people start crying. And I'm like, why'd you eat all the yeah. food? And Anger I'm, starts to stir. Oh, yeah. I got angry. He's crying. I'm like, then the, Calvin's mad at Drew for eating his food, and he's mad. He's like, you're going to carry both my packs then. You know, there's all of a sudden we, Brotherly it love. cranks Not up. Not really. Like, well, I'm like, Jeez, Jesus, can you get yeah. in the middle of this? Yeah. So there's this tension going on. We're walking out of the mountain, yeah. and... Uh, and, and we're cranky at each other yeah, now. Oh, yeah. Somebody's not fin- not nourished. Other people are like, you know, thirsty, and we're climbing up steep shale, and you know, they're young, so they don't have the stamina like yeah. you and I do. Well, anyways, we look behind, and all of a sudden comes a, a dad, a young dad, like 24, and a mom uh, with, a, with a three-year-old on one hand and a baby, and a baby Bjorn. Same trail. Same trail. <laughs> and my, my kids are crying and cranky, and they look around like, they, all of a sudden, they stood right up, and they started marching. And I'm telling you, that was the best two miles I ever had because they wanted to keep up with the mom with the baby Bjorn on her chest. And it kind of worked itself out. Perspective got <laughs> reinserted. I yeah. love that story. Um, <laughs> the idea of relearning things. Mm. Being a dad who relearns or raising boys, in your case, that kind of are open to, curious about, humble enough to relearn. Would mm. you go into that topic a little bit? Sure, sure. I know... Relearn, relearn as a parent. Mm-hmm. You know, we were big love and logic, big, pretty popular, sure. pretty popular uh, curriculum for any young parents out there that are trying to make their way in the world. Very big on it. We implied it. If if our sons did this, they got the consequence or the reward. Sure. Pretty and to be keep it simple. Well, Danny Silk and a Danny Silk and another friend of ours, Seth Dahl, got involved and we started learning about heart to heart connection yeah. and learning about that. It might not always work this way, and um, approach. might have to relearn. And yeah. so, you know, raising kids is all about us. It's really not about our kids. And no. I was a very, as I talked about, I was a very stern task taskmaster. I wanted it this way, and I had a I had a rigid uh, curriculum about myself. And I had to get up at five, and I had to go to bed. Just and it was exhausting. Yeah, it really was, and it looked good on the outside. It was shiny on the outside. Shoot. But it kind of stunk on in the inside because it affected everybody. Yeah. And I had to, I had to relearn how to parent. And if I had to relearn that I was going to put their hearts first. I had to, it had to cost me something. It had to cost me um, doing it my way and having to have my wife make the dinner on you know, these, di- these nights and, and me do it the other nights. And it had to be a certain way. No, no. I had to be way more flexible. Yeah, it's good. Had to invite in, had to had to invite in uh, some friends to give us perspective, and had to relearn from them in our community, and had to be d- just a different parent where I had to I had to fail at one thing to to achieve a heart to heart connection in another area with my kids, and so a B, I had a good friend Aaron McHugh if he's listening, uh, he used to say, "Bird, it's okay to get a B yeah. once in a while. You need to get straight A's. Yeah. Get a B." So I used to I said, "I need to get a B at." whether it was showing up at the program at church, being a little bit late so I could parent my kids and take them off while my wife got ready or sure. took some pressure off. It's good. Those with young guys. Yeah. And, and maybe fail in some person's eyes to help the other. Walking grace Rocking, for yourself. Yeah. 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 So yeah. that's a little bit of a hmm. relearning that I've had to do with parenting. It's still, it's still happening. Yeah. <laughs>